God says his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are his ways our ways. Our ways would say, hey, you know what? We don't like something. We tell them. We don't think something's right. We stand up for our rights. When we want something, we can either take it, we can make it, we can refuse it, or we can do it. You know, I mean, we don't, we don't sit down and say, what can I do to help that person? That's not the normal routine. The normal routine is me, my, mine. I, I, I. And in these latter days, especially with so much information being bombarded upon the born-again Christian, there is a whole onslaught of spiritual warfare going on. One of it is just to simply misinform the Christian. So you wind up with this whole massive amount of Christianity that's very confused and abused by information that isn't knowledge. In other words, what happens is that lots of data is thrown at you. I'll give you an example. It's the end of the world because Israel is going to attack Iran. But they haven't done it yet, but they're going to. Now, it's been going on for three years, but they're going to do it. So it's the end of the world then. Syria is going to change their government, so the end of the world has come, and you've got to get ready, get ready, you know. Because this is true. Israel is attacking Iran someday, maybe, could be. And it is true that Syria is, you know, like changing governments. And, oh, by the way, and we also, you know, uh, 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 Libya, we, we, got the, we got that taken care of, but now, oh, no, the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. They're coming down from the north. Oh, no. The Europeans are assembling. They're getting together. They have 17 nations, but they're going to they're coming down to ten. Oh, the Chinese are coming. The Chinese are coming. The Chinese have got one of their helicopters. They're going to make it like this. Where is the American prophecy? Where are they? You're being bombarded. You're being hyped. You're being fed and overloaded with calories. You've become a fat information pig, literally. Because what happens is that if you're on the internet, you don't filter out what isn't true from what is true. Because unless you have been an information system specialist and you've been trained to watch what your eye receives, unless you've been taught by experience in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to filter out a lot of what you see and to just ignore or become even some ways hardened of heart to some of the, the information that's out there, you really don't know what's true because it can wind you up like a top. can make you like a hamster in a wheel. Oh boy, i got to get some more information. Let me go check my latest my latest tabloid site. Oh, oh, look at this. It's such a professional site. They got beautiful graphics. Oh, they got dancing girls. Oh, they got music. Oh, they've got, wow, look at that. They're all sitting around in shirts and ties and suits. And they're presenting the information like it's so real. Oh, my God. It must be true. Really? <laughs> look at that guy, man. He's wearing a hat. He's got like one of those red shirts on and he's wearing a t-shirt and he's sitting in front of his computer. He can't be right. <laughs> Would you rather a jackass spoke? <laughs> in other words, information will be thrown at you constantly over and over and over again in these last days. It's going to be thrown at you so fast, so furious, that you don't have time to process it unless you're trained. Even those that are trained like I am, will be overwhelmed by the amount of information that is bombarding you so quickly that you can't adapt to it. If you'll notice something, when you talk to techies, and I, network, I have a network engineering degree, so when I went to school, we techies, you know, I went to Computer Learning Center in Anaheim, we techies, we were talking like this. We were able to get so fast. You know, I was like, oh, wow, did you see that? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we had literally books. Oh, I can't even find them. About this thick that we would have to read every night to keep up with what was changing so fast in the computer industry. So as we kept winding ourselves up, 
we would talk faster and we could relate to each other and we lived in a different world you know there was always the programmers that lived in a, definitely in a different world and there was the network engineers who had some smatterings of programming that could relate to those that were in programming but you know we had to be able to adapt to all of it and so as a network engineer you know i had to be able to process volumes of information by speed reading and any technique that you could use to assimilate massive amounts of information correlate it in some kind of format and then regurgitate it unto the resolution of a problem or a resolution or um, demonstration of the fact that the information was there and that I could coordinate it in a way that would present a solution once I started to formulate that plan and operate within those parameters that needed to be done. So because I had been trained for that, I was more adept and adaptable to all this massive information being thrown at you. But even for me, there's a spiritual warfare going on because when you have massive information, your emotion is submerged underneath a mountain of information. So then your emotion has to come filtering up through this massive amount of information. Sometimes what filters through that massive information isn't necessarily peace, love, and joy. It can be frustration. It can be aggravation. It can be reaction as opposed to action. It can be things that weren't meant to be connecting the dots in your brain with the information that's been thrown in your head. It's a spiritual battle because your soul once your emotional brain has been so filled with all this data, your brain wants to filter it. It wants to put it in, and for men, compartmentalize it somewhere. It wants to say, hey, I want to put this over here, and that over there, and that over there, and that over there. And your emotions go, hey, you know what? Here I am. I'm sitting right here, and you want to put all this data right here, right here where I am. So, bam, guess what? That data gets a blockage in your brain. It does, seriously. It's called a synopsis and what happens is that here you are with all these little fingers which are called synopsis and there's electrical charge that goes back and forth and that's what makes your thought process so when your thought process kind of goes like that you know and it's jumping back and forth and then suddenly this one wants to connect with this one and it goes ah uh, no suddenly that information creates a emotional response you go ah, I'm mad why am I mad well I don't know why I'm mad see that's the process of knowledge when you say you don't know why you're mad then you have to ask yourself well, why am I mad then if I don't know why I'm mad because maybe you're reacting by emotion to something that's just information that hasn't been processed by way of knowledge and application of putting it somewhere in the right compartment in your brain in order for your emotions to not get attached to the wrong information this is what happens with tabloid Christianity People will hype you. Oh my God! It's 2011! And they said the world's ending! And you go, no, it's not. And you go, ooh, well, maybe. Hmm, there's more people starting. Look at that. Somebody else is. There's, there's 10 websites. Oh wow, there's 100 websites. Oh no! I can't believe it! No. You've been making more connections in your brain gradually adding to this ton of information that's trying to figure out yes, no, or flush it. So the information overload age is what you're in. You're getting too much information for you to filter. Jesus said, to, if you want the scripture for it, is the light of the eye. The eye is full of light. If the light of the eye is full of darkness, then how great is the darkness in it? But if it be full of light, how great is the light? So whatever you're taking in the most of is what's going to affect you inside. And that's what happens with information. It overloads the noggin. So you have to do some spiritual discernment here. You have to kind of like go, on a practical level, how much information can I really process? And according to most scientists, I'm not going to say about cultural because there are different cultures that are better at certain things, you know, like we've got, pardon me, but a lot of Oriental people seem to have a huge mathematical advantage to a lot of people that don't seem to study math. <laughs> oh, well, and a lot of Jewish people seem to have, you know, some other 
tendencies that we're pretty good at. <laughs> but anyways, the point being is that in that way, there are certain amount of information you can handle and a certain amount you can't. And so you should take a balance of it. You should learn to recognize the signs, the symptoms. That which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. The flesh war against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. So sometimes you're going to find this battle for that information to be processed in certain ways that either it has a spiritual significance or it doesn't have a spiritual significance. And then you have an outside influence that wants you to make the wrong decisions about the information you're taking in. Wants you to be deceived and wants you to be overwhelmed and wants you to be reactive and wants you to be not peaceful, not loving, most essentially not loving, because that's the number one thing that Satan will rebel against in you and try to cause you to get stumbled over, is to not love the brethren. If you can be divided from the brethren, hey, then you're out there on your own, because God said, you know, <laughs> if you love, then the love of the Father is in you, and God is in you, and you are in God, and God is you know, one, and you're one, and you're together with God. But if he could separate you from your brethren, that you will say, well, how can man say that he loves if he doesn't love the brethren, for the love of God is not in him, so then he's not in God. So if you don't love the brethren, then you're already finding yourself, guess what? Criticizing them and accusing them so that when you are asked to be part of this kingdom of God, that God says, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? You have to recuse yourself from being able to do anything for God because you have already separated yourself from the love of God that was in Christ Jesus that you were supposed to love the brethren with while you were here. I'm supposed to love that little sucker? Man, I hate him. I want to shoot him. I want to take my gun, you know, and put it in my pants and nail that sucker. Yeah, right. Spiritual warfare. So, because of this information age, there's a lot of symptoms and warning signs that you have to be careful of and you have to be aware of. You have to recognize you were meant for a kingdom that's not of this world. So now, we get on the internet and we get people that are bombarded with information so then they don't realize this. Their action or reaction, let's say, let's say you get wound up, you're, you're, we're going to cut this quick, you know, because I know I'm talking a long time, but say you get all wound up and you're like, ah, well, look at that. Yeah, the president did this, and the president did that, and by golly, I want to do that to him, and I'll do that to her, and you know what, I want to just, you know, <laughs> and you're spewing. Then you get on the internet, and you start typing, you go, ah, show them, and with anger and malice in your heart, you type out something, and you post it on the internet. Now you think, okay, well, I didn't say anything that bad, I didn't mean it that bad. Oh, Lord, you know, it was my attitude, but nobody knows what my attitude was when I typed it. Let me say something to you now that's going to blow your mind. I hope. If it doesn't blow your mind, okay. Reject it. The spirit with which you are typing that message, that attitude is going across and is attaching itself somehow, spiritually, to your words that are being read by someone else. You're going, Nah! I can only tell you this. If you're a spiritual nut, you know, and you're into spiritual warfare, this will be good for you. If you're not, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. Go ahead, throw it away, you know. But all I can do is tell you a fact, you know, and it's a reality. If you are writing something, that attitude that you have, believe it or not, I hate to say it this way, but that spirit of whatever it is somehow goes from you in some spiritual dimension, connects itself to the words you wrote with the attitude you have, and that person feels your feeling. Now, they may not accept it and make it a part of their life, and it may not hit them in such a hard way, or, you know, they may have some spiritual, you know, shield up, or they think they do, or whatever, they may be ready for it, you know, and they may go like this and that, you know, and just go, 
you know, and recognize that that's just informational overload. It's just data, but there's a spirit connected to it. So what happens is when you're overloaded with data, all this junk that's connected to this data that, remember I told you how it was overloading you? Down here is your emotions. Guess what? When you have all this negative stuff inside all this data, it sinks to the bottom of this emotional overload. Then it begins to kind of hit on all these neuroreceptors. Guess what? That's trying to process the information. And you've got this big fist that's bending back your neuroreceptors. Now, are they physically bending back the neuroreceptors? No, but they're hardening that receptivity of the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you into peace, love, joy, meekness, temperance, kindness, gentleness, and the presence of God and the knowledge of truth and conviction of sin. So when that emotion that that person has added to the words that are already violent in nature or antagonistic or mean-spirited, Notice the word mean spirited. Then you read them, and you go, ah! and you get mad. Ask yourself this what are you mad about? Read the words again and try to separate yourself from emotion. Don't think of it as being talking to you, because why would you think it's talking to you? Unless they use your name. And I try to tell people that, they don't get it. So I'm trying to warn you now look at what you're doing. When you read on the internet, Facebook, Twitter, wherever, and you react to it, look at what you just did. Look at how you feel. Examine yourself for a moment. Try to get right now a moment that the Holy Spirit can give you some clarity of issue one-on-one. -on -one. Close your eyes, talk to him, see if it's true, and see if God the Holy Spirit isn't telling you there is a spiritual warfare going on and you're maybe a victim of it without ever knowing. You're being manipulated by overwhelming information. That's one way. I'm not going to say all the other ways because we'll be here all day. But overwhelming information has got some emotion attached to it and the negative emotions weigh down through that information and they harden you and then they provoke you into reacting to that information that's behind what's being said. So it's not really what's the words themselves only, but it's the spirit and the attitude that's connected to it that the person who wrote it is doing to you without you knowing it. And sometimes you're doing it to someone else without realizing you're communicating that. Could that be baptism? Hmm. Baptism, Holy Spirit, you know, cleanse your mind, kind of wash your soul. I mean... I don't want to get into, you know, the Pentecostal idealism because the Pentecostals go way over the deep end. You know, sometimes they get into this presence stuff and gold dust and whatever, fire and brimstone and, you know, too many things that are carried away. But I do want to make you realize there is a spirit there. There is a spirit that is connected to words. That is why in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning, the same was with God. And... There is a spirit that is connected to what you're doing that's affecting others without you knowing you're doing it. So you could use that in one way. You could be proactive by being full of love and joy and peace, you know, kind of sending out some loving messages and feel <laughs> happy about it, you know, like, oh, I'm happy, and then, you know, write something and see if you don't blow somebody's mind on the other end. Or also, you could be warned that Man, you know, if you're reading all this stuff and it's like, you know, you're starting to get like, you know, why am I getting really irritated and mad and, you know, frustrated and aggravated and, you know, this stuff and that stuff, you know, I don't understand it. And Maybe you should take a listen again to this tape or a video or watch it and understand you're in a spiritual battle for your soul, your mind, and your heart. It's trying to overwhelm you to make you negative-minded, and I don't mean negative versus positive, because we all have soul full of emotions and feelings. It's okay to be down sometimes and then up. But we're being provoked into reacting in a negative way. We're being provoked to be mad. We're being provoked to 
made violent, we're being provoked to be overwhelmed, we're getting frustrated, our neurons, as it were, our connectors, even in the spiritual dimension, our little sensitivities are being bombarded constantly and finally beaten down to the point where the hardening of heart has occurred to where it's so tough in there that that heart of stone has to be removed for a heart of flesh to come in. Are you sensitizing your neural connectors to where every little thing is that sensitive? You can recognize by the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit how gentle and peaceful those words aren't that you wrote that are being communicated that someone else said unto you. Are you really that tender to be recognizing the heart of God? How love can be sensitized to the point of being so emotive you can react to something and say, oh, wow, that's beautiful. Or are you so hardened of heart that you're so used to seeing violence and yuckiness and slander and, and murder and vulgarity and sin that you're no longer tenderized by God? That you suddenly no longer have a sensitive soul that's overwhelmed by the Spirit of God to live on the outside with your heart, not on your sleeve, but out there to the humanity, ready to be punctured and wounded, ready to be laid down for the love of God to save people from hell itself. Or have we become a face on a phony book portraying words of delusion that are only confusing people by the amount of information they're taking in and never seeing the spirit and the attitude and the actions that are warring with our soul. What are you doing? Know ye not that you are the children of God? Know ye not that you are the body of Christ and members in particular? Know ye not that your words have influence? But the spirit that you have inside is doing something to someone else and they are doing something to you? Be careful about this and be careful about this. You need to filter what's being done to you. And wisdom and knowledge is the accumulation of experience of knowing how to deal with information that might be weighing you down. My kingdom and greater works shall, thee, shall you do because I go unto my Father. While I was on the earth, to those with whom I came in contact, mine was a lost cause. Even my disciples only believed half doubting and half wondering. When they all forsook me and fled, it was not so much fear of my enemies as the certainty that my mission, however beautiful they thought it, had failed. They all fled. In spite of all I had taught them, in spite of the revelation of the Last Supper, they had secretly felt sure that when the final moment came and the hatred of the Pharisees was declared against me, I should sound some call of action and take violent means or succor my own rescue. That I should lead my many followers and found and set up my earthly kingdom for them, for I could. Even the disciples who had eyes to see my spiritual kingdom had thought material forces had proved too strong for me. We had believed, and we thought he was the Messiah, but he died. But with my resurrection came hope. Faith revived. They would remind each other of all that I had said. They would have the assurance of my divinity, my messiahship, and they would have all my power in the unseen realm, the Holy Spirit, literally himself, to help them and guide them and to teach them and to lead them. Those who lived in the kingdom were to do the work, greater works than I was able to do. Not a greater power shown, not a greater life lived, but as men recognized my Godhead, opportunities to work in my name that would increase the kingdom of God throughout the entire world that it would become greater and more unveiling of who God was as they revealed who he is in them. The kingdom of God is under assault. It is being bombarded. 
the church of God is being assaulted by hell itself in order for people to look at the return of Jesus, but not Jesus. To look at the things that are about to happen, but not what's happening around them. To look at who they can separate from rather than who they can save. To look at who they can condemn rather than they can confirm in the Christian way of discipling that would cause them to come to a conformity in God that would simply be demonstrated by the love the person has for Jesus that they want to have the same love that person has. It's not about telling someone what to do. It's about revealing who Jesus in you are. As you celebrate your life in Him, people want to celebrate with you that life. It's all about this total information that's going to weigh you down to where your brain is going to say, I have to delineate between religion and relationship. And how am I going to marry the two? How can I tell what's right and wrong? How shall a man cleanse his way? How can a person walk in these latter days when so much spiritual attack and onslaught and information is out there? One way. Simplify. Simplify. Take it back to the beginning. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. Don't overwhelm yourself with all information. Choose you this day whom you will walk with. Choose you this day whom you will talk with. Choose you this day whom you will look at. Choose you this day whom you will listen to. Choose you this day whom you will pay attention to. Because there are people who have said they have gone into heaven and talked to Jesus. And they took the time to stop what they were doing, fasted and prayed in order to do it. And I don't mean just Paul, though he was one. There is more to this life of having a relationship with God than believing in God without having the demonstration of God alive in your life. The warfare is meant to distract you away from the attraction Jesus gave you to want to go into heaven to talk to your Father, to know Jesus physically in this world now and hear Him and know Him. Because if you do, then you set aside all these techniques, manifestations, giftings and worries and frets and carries because you just trust in the Lord with all your heart. You just lean into His understanding and not your own. You acknowledge Him in all your ways and you let Him direct your path slowly. You let Him each day tell you what to do. Not to become a super theologian who likely is going to go wrong track then right track. He doesn't say go out there and be a superstar so that you can bring everyone to where you are. He says, no, walk with me this day. Talk with me this day. Be my child and I will be your God. You will be my son and I will be your father. You can know me intimately and I will come in and sup with you. You can see God and I will meet with you face to face. Don't be spiritually deceived and walk away from God in a personal way, by getting enticed into a religious observation way of trying to do things your way in a ministry that God didn't say. If you have to walk away from information age stuff like Facebook or Twitter or TV or even your iPods or your, your congregation at times to sit alone and wait on the Lord one-on-one, -on -one, mano y mano with God himself, with Jesus declaring to you, I am saying to you, I want you, then take a moment, whatever, how long it takes to do it. When God breathed upon dead flesh, it came alive. 
if God so chooses to breathe upon you, he may take you alive, like Enoch, into heaven. There's nothing stopping him. So what's stopping you? Do you really love God that much? Do you love Jesus so much so you're willing to go that far to know him? I hope so, because you're in a battle, and it is a spiritual warfare. And you got to know how to fight, or you're going to lose. But you know what? You just might win in the end.